I declare this meeting of the City of Port Phillip Council open and I welcome members of the public that are here tonight. The City of Port Phillip respectfully acknowledges the Yalakut Willem clan of the Boomerang. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present, and we acknowledge and uphold their traditional relationship to this land. Council has a local law that determines how this meeting will be conducted. There's a time allotted in tonight's agenda for public question time. During public question time, members of the public can ask a specific question uh, on general matters other than those that are relating to an item on the agenda. Members of the public are only to ask a specific question and shall not provide any statements or contextual comments relating to that question. Consequently, the official meeting minutes will only record the question asked and any response given. The number of questions that a member of the public may ask shall be at the discretion of the chairperson. There's also an opportunity for members of the public to ask a question or make a comment on a specific item on tonight's agenda. This will be done prior to the council hearing that item. And we certainly encourage comments from the public that are directed through the mayor are not defamatory, abusive or objectionable in language or substance, but rather are presented in the spirit of mutual respect of the council and the community. And we ask all speakers to abide by the direction of the chair. If you wish to ask a question or speak to a report, please complete the blue form. That's available at the table just outside the uh, chambers and hand it to a staff member. And I encourage you to try and keep your, limit your, your comments to around three minutes and avoid repeating what other people have said. So please note um, that all meetings are now being live streamed, as you can probably see that uh, lovely white thing there. Um, live streaming and recording allows the community to watch and listen to meetings in real time, providing greater access to council decision making and debate and improving the openness and transparency. The live stream of this meeting is available on our council website and the recording of this meeting will also be available to view on council's website in about 20, 48 hours. The cameras will film and record councillors at this meeting, however care will be taken not to film or record images of the members of the public. If a member of the public asks a question or makes a comment about an agenda item, they will not be filmed, but their voice will be heard in the live stream and recorded. So please also note in accordance with Council's local law that this meeting cannot be audio or videotaped unless permission is granted by the Mayor. Okay, we'll move to the agenda. Um, item one, apologies. <coughs> Councillors, do we have any apologies? Councillor Councillor Gross. Councillor Louise Crawford. Is an apology. Thank you. And I think that's it. Um, would someone like to move that we that move the acceptance? Um, Councillor Gross to move, Councillor Simic to second. I'll now put that motion. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. We'll move to the item number two, minutes of the previous meeting. Councillors, the minutes of the ordinary meeting held on uh, 17th of May 2017 have been circulated. Are there any questions relating to the minutes? If not, can I have a motion? Councillor Bond to move. Councillor um, Pearl to second. I'll now put that motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Item three, declarations of conflicts of interest. Does any councillor have a conflict of interest in any matters being discussed at tonight's meeting? I note there are none. Item four, petitions and joint letters. Councillors, we don't have any petitions or joint letters tonight. Item five, the sealing schedule, and likewise we have no documents requiring sealing. So we'll go to item six. Item six is public question time. And councillors, we've got two members of the public that have requested to ask a question tonight. And I'll take them in the order that they're on the sheet here. So I'll ask uh, Mr Peter Martin, please, to come forward. Mr Martin, if you could take a seat and turn on the microphone and state your name and suburb for the record, please. Uh, Peter Martin, Principal, Port Melbourne Primary School and currently a Malvern resident about to move back to City of Port Phillip. 
My question concerns the rapid growth of my school, which has now over 800 children and is likely to have that number for the next five or six years, while at the same time Ferrar Street will have 500 children at the new school there within five years, giving us 1,300 primary school aged children very close to Port Melbourne. My first question concerns the traffic management around the Port Melbourne Primary School, and I'd like to know what Council's plans are to improve pedestrian safety of traffic movement in the vicinity of the primary school. And the second part of the question is, given the fact that we'll have 1,300 primary school aged children within about a mile and a half, or sorry, two kilometres, I'm showing my age, of Murphy Reserve, as well as probably well over 1,000 secondary school aged children with those numbers growing and growing, what plans does Council have to improve the recreational facilities at Murphy Reserve so that all those young people are able to access it and that the rest of the community can also access that reserve and its facilities on weekdays? And last but not least, at a time when we're having probably three to 400 young women using that facility at weekends. Thank you, Mr Martin. Um, Mr Walters, are you able to um, provide an answer to both of those questions? No, just one? Okay, not sure which one, but go ahead. Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, Mr Trail might also have a, a comment on this. But uh, with respect to traffic movements in the vicinity of the Farrar Street School, there's an intersection upgrade at the corner of Farrar's and City Road, which will improve, is aimed to improve pedestrian access at that intersection. And naturally, there are uh, school, school zones, traffic zones uh, in the precinct to reduce speed to 40 kilometres an hour. They're, they're two significant ones, but the long term plan has some more significant traffic calming uh, elements to it. Sorry, Mr Walters, I think the question was specifically around the Port Melbourne Primary School. Um, traffic movements around the Port Melbourne Primary School or for our street? Uh, Pedestrian oh, safe sorry. safety. Uh, no, I beg your pardon. I will have to take that on notice. I thought the question was about for our street, but I'm linking the thing. Sorry, Mr Martin. Mr Trail? Um, through you, Madam Mayor, in regards to the question regarding Murphy Reserve, um, Murphy Reserve has had a master plan... Um, created for that. Uh, some of the highlights of uh, what's been achieved through that master plan is the establishment of a brand new rectangular oval, uh, sorry, uh, space for, for sport. Um, we have uh, created new pathways. We are currently installing some sports ground lighting to maximise open space usage and uh, create some more opportunities. And a current project that we are working with all tenant clubs at Murphy Reserve is the upgrade to a pavilion project. Thank you, um, Mr Trail. Thank you, Mr Martin. Um, Miss Annette Maloney, please. Is that on? Yep. Hi, my name's Annette Maloney. I'm the secretary of the Port Melbourne Colts Junior Football Club, and I'm also the school council president at Port My Melbourne Primary School and a resident. But my question tonight is around our concern with the tagging that's been happening to our pavilion on a weekly basis. Firstly, I want to thank council and all involved for the very quick clean up of that issue. It's become pretty much epidemic that um, every time you guys come and paint it and clean it up, within a couple of nights it's been tagged again. So um, our committees met and had a chat about this and what we would like to do is um, seek council's approval at our own cost and no cost to council to let our club install CCTV footage, um, CCTV facilities to the Murphy Reserve Pavilion. Thank you. That's a question. Ms Maloney? Yes, so, it is. Are we able to do that? Yes. Um, Ms Davis, thank you. Thank you very much for that generous offer through you, Madam Mayor. Um, we too are very frustrated and disappointed with what's been happening. Um, we will take your offer, very kind offer, on notice and consider it with a range of other improvements and um, deterrent activities that we are contemplating at the moment. We will be working with councillors over the next couple of weeks, specifically around the problem at JL Murphy Reserve. This weekend, we will install some additional lighting, so tower, towers of lighting to light up the place. We've found that that has been helpful in the past at other places where we've had a hotspot. 
We'll also increase our security patrols and our staff are meeting with the police tomorrow to request that they also um, run some extra patrols if their resources allow it across the long weekend. Fantastic, thank you. I hear Barry Manilow music also is a bit of a deterrent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Maloney. Okay. That um, brings us to the end of um, public question time. We'll move to item seven, which is councillor question time. Councillors, um, do you have any questions that you like? Councillor Pearl. Can I just ask a follow up on the. I was going to ask a question about Murphy's Reserve, but just to follow up on the, the last question. What's the timeline for that? So, the process and timeline. Uh, the recommendations you're going to make, when will they come back to Council? Uh, when do you expect them to come back and when will we be making a decision on the kind offer that was just made and then other improvements that you will propose? Through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, officers intend to discuss a range of options with councillors on the 28th of June. We've booked in a time to do that through the councillor briefings. And it'll be at that point that we can settle on some of the initiatives, some of which don't require a council decision, and, and those, some of those that I've outlined earlier for this weekend. Um, but in relation to the CCTV, I'd just like to take some further advice. Thank you, Ms Davis. Do you have a follow-up, Councillor? The, the CCTV proposal will be included on that, in that briefing? Yep, thank you. No, no further questions, thank you. Councillor Simic. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the environment effects statement for the Westgate Tunnel project has been released. Have officers reviewed the EES uh, and are there any preliminary thoughts on what the impacts on the project are on the City of Port Phillip? Mr Walters. Through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, yes, officers have uh, certainly aware of the EES. Uh, we intend to do an officer submission. The um, consultation period closes on the 10th of July, so we don't have enough time to bring back to the chamber, but uh, broadly speaking, the effects are likely to be um, positive, slightly, if, if short-lived for the city of Port Phillip. Most of the effects of the tunnel appear to impact Maribyrnong and city of Melbourne, where the tunnel entry and exit points are, but they will um, shift truck movements away from the Westgate Bridge itself, which may have a, a positive effect on city of Port Phillip. And we'll bring back that information to council in the form of a councillor note or, or a briefing. So um, just to clarify, if I can, it'll be an officer's submission. Will it come to council for endorsement or just for noting? Uh, it will it'll go in as an officer's submission before, before council get to comment on it, but we can bring it back for endorsement, whatever's required. OK, thank you, Mr Walters. Councillors, any other questions? Councillor Copsey? Thanks. At our last council meeting, I asked some questions um, regarding the Commonwealth Bank and the Adani Coal Project, uh, following community members contacting me to express concerns. So the concerns outlined from community members were reports that the Commonwealth Bank has had dealings and links with the Adani Corporation in the past. One. Two, that the Commonwealth Bank still has no policy that rules out new fossil fuel projects. And thirdly, that the Commonwealth Bank might fund the Adani Carmichael mine. So I understand that officers have received some preliminary responses from the Commonwealth Bank and was wondering if they could report those back. Thank you, Mr O'Keefe. Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, Councillor, indeed, I have engaged with the um, Commonwealth Bank local government head in Victoria. Um, unfortunately, I uh, wasn't able to get a clear guidance from him on the three matters that you referred to. Um, the particular advice I received from them, that they weren't willing to discuss uh, the private nature of clients' uh, business transactions. Um, they do understand the community um, position uh, expressed through yourself on this. Uh, they did relay a number of issues regarding the fact that their invest uh, their Investments in um, renewable energy proposals are now four times the size of their fossil fuel uh, activities. Um, but there was no clear statement that they would be in a position to provide uh, guidance around their overall policy at this point in time on investing in new uh, fossil fuel uh, projects. They did make the point that they take each investment proposal on its merit 
and the Commonwealth Bank has a significant interest in reviewing projects. Uh, it also takes on board the social responsibility and environmental impacts of those projects. But I think, as you've seen in the press as well, we've had difficulty getting any statements at this point in time from Commonwealth Bank on their specific involvement in Adani. Follow up, if I may. Thank you, Mr. O'Keefe, for um, those inquiries and for relay relaying that to the public so it's on the record. Um, so I understand, so the Commonwealth Bank has essentially restated its current policy position for you. Through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, that's correct, Councillor. Uh, effectively, um, I, I wasn't in a position to provide any additional information based on the previous engagement we had with them. Thank you. And was this question specifically put to them whether they will consider a new policy that rules out lending to new fossil fuel projects? That question was, uh, through you, Madam Mayor, that question was specifically put to uh, the officer uh, of the bank that I engaged with, uh, and he was uh, quite frank in responding that they weren't in a position to, to do that. Final question. So I don't consider that a satisfactory response to the City of Port Phillip's question on this matter and I'd ask that we um, seek a specific response on the question of a new policy to rule out fossil fuel projects in the future. Through you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I'm quite happy to uh, go back to them uh, and actually escalate the issue up through the higher levels of the organisation. Um, Councillor Copsey, um, we have a policy um, that you might be, look, you could look at that, you know, perhaps foreshadow that that's coming forward and maybe that's the way to, to go forward. Yeah. Any other questions, councillors? I have one. Um, so my question is, a, is again on um, dilapidated and derelict buildings, um, Ballarat is introducing new laws um, and I did forward the article to the officers um, to combat dilapidated and derelict buildings being left as eyesores for our community. I've been requesting this to be changed for you know, over four years now and I was again after an update on what City of Port Phillip's doing and whether we can learn anything from Ballarat Council and if the officers can please give specific information as to whether this is a change in the municipal strategic statement or local laws, also a timeline for the consultation with councillors and the implementation please. Through you Madam Mayor, firstly um, the local laws are currently being reviewed there are two local laws um, related to the question that you've asked. One is under section 57 for dangerous and unsightly land and the other is around fencing. In accordance with section uh, clause 57, a property will be determined to be dangerous or unsightly where the appearance of the land is of neglect or out of character with other land in the vicinity. And in relation to the fencing, um, we are upgrading or rewording that local law to allow local laws officers greater um, enforceable powers to take action. Um, in relation to, we have com discussed this with Ballarat Council and our, what we are going to be proposing in the local law review is consistent with what Ballarat is proposing. However, the level of penalties that Ballarat uh, are contemplating are slightly higher than the penalty rates that we are currently contemplating. Nevertheless, we are seeking legal advice on that at the moment and we'll be able to bring you further details. A follow-up question, if I may, um, uh, Ms Davis, is, uh, is, it, is it a, de a deterrent? You know, um, is it soft? Is this going to um, you know, actually make people change their behaviours with leaving buildings derelict? Through you, Madam Mayor. Yes, we believe that increasing um, the uh, strength of the local law and increasing the penalty amount will be a deterrent um, to people having unsightly derelict properties in the municipality. And in, in relation to the second part of my question about timelines, was yes. there any information on that? Yes, through you, Madam Mayor. We're currently um, reviewing those uh, clauses in relation to the derelict and unsightly building and fencing as 
um, has been discussed, and we're also um, undertaking other minor reviews of the local law, and that'll be presented to council in July at a council meeting, and um, then with a proposal to undertake an external consultation process in relation to those local laws. And the, the laws that regulate unsightly derelict, derelict building relate to council's local law and not to the municipal strategic statement. Thank you, Ms James. Any further questions, councillors? Okay then, um, we'll move on to the presentation of reports. Um, so we'll go to 8.1, which is the Victorian Pride Centre. Uh, the public notice as required by section 189 of the Local Government Act uh, for the intention to transfer first site to uh, 3 slash 77 Fitzroy Street, St Kilda to the Victorian Pride Centre. There are no members of the public that have requested to speak to this item. So, councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? I have one. Just um, given that we have made significant inroads you know, in to um, make this happen, this consultation process I hate to say it, but is it genuine? You know, what if what happens if we get a lot of um, negative feedback about the site transfer? What then? What um, what what's the process? Through you, um, thank you, Madam Mayor. The the uh, proposal, the submission that was made by council was contingent on all appropriate legislative processes being undertaken. And so uh, this is now the process that, this is a stage in the process that we're at, is undertaking our due process. And so the offer, uh, which has been accepted, was accepted with that understanding that we needed to undertake due process. Thank you. Any further questions, councillors? Then we have an officer's recommendation. Um, do I have a mover for that or something else? Councillor Gross to move. Councillor Baxter to second. Councillor Gross, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, Madam Mayor. Oh, good on you. Madam Mayor, um, no pun intended, I, I'm proud to move this um, to take the next step in what I think is going to be a really important investment for this community and um, this council. Um, <coughs> as described by officers both here and in the paper, this is the next step. I take this step um, without any fear that there's going to be a community backlash, but it is important that we listen to anything that, that um, is said. Uh, I think that I anticipate, and I know this because all I've had ever since you and the Minister launched the idea at, um, in Fitzroy Street, all I've ever had is uh, acclamation and support. So I embark on the next step uh, with no sense of um, fear at all, and I'm just lucky that I stumbled upon a council that... Uh, and was elected to a council that undertakes tasks like this. Um, so I commend this uh, resolution to my fellow councillors. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Councillor Baxter? No? Uh, would anyone else like to speak? Um, Councillor Brand Bond? I think this is our first opportunity to speak to this publicly. Um, just like to acknowledge the efforts of our previous CEO uh, Ms Tracy Slatter in bringing this about and the previous council who uh, put this, um, this this opportunity in process probably about 12 months ago now, 11 months ago. Um, acknowledge them who, who are not, most of whom are not here tonight. That's all. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Anybody else? Councillor Brand? Yes, I'd just like um, to say that I think the importance of this 
project is is uh, of a well, maybe even national, certainly state significance, but uh, just on a very parochial level, I think on behalf of the people of Fitzroy Street, we're very much uh, uh, appreciative and grateful and excited by uh, this possible new presence, and so you know, heartily endorse the, um, the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Any further requests to speak, councillors? No, then Councillor Gross, would you like to close? Then I'll put that. All those in favour? It's carried unanimously. Thank you. And we'll move to item 8.2. And 8.2 we have 15 members, 16 members of the public that have requested to speak. So I'm going to hear them in the order that they are here. I'd like to request, um, actually 8.2 is for the draft council plan 2017 to 2017. 27 and the budget for 2017-18. So we're hearing submissions. Uh, I would like to ask Karen Bryant, please. Welcome, Ms. Bryant. If you could state your name and suburb, please. Karen Bryant. Um, I, uh, I live in Brighton, uh, but I represent Midsummer Festival, which is uh, based at the CBD, but has a range of activities that occur within uh, the city of Port Phillip. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to a couple of the key points. Uh, Midsummer is Victoria's premier arts and cultural festival and organisation for communities uh, that live with shared experiences around diverse gender and sexuality. Um, our primary activity is the festival in summer, which takes place over 22 days. And um, out of the portion, um, we have run 130 plus events, a large portion of them in your area, and uh, one of those being uh, probably one of our two most significant sized events being Pride March, um, which occurs in the middle of our festival. We enjoy a really positive relationship with the city of Port Phillip. Um, and um, I'm here just to speak uh, because, particularly around the Pride March, we're a very lean organisation. We've been able to leverage uh, all of the other festival resources to, to deliver Pride March um, cost effectively by minimising costs across the whole festival. Um, we successfully raise over 79 per cent of the total income outside of state and local government, um, and it is quite a costly event to run. Um, it does have a significant reach. Um, overall, we reach over 300,000 people, and it's not just within our core demographic of LGBTIQ communities, but we have a very significant representation of Indigenous communities that take part the disability sector, particularly um, a very strong contingent within the hearing impaired community that take place um, within the whole festival and Pride March. Culturally and linguistically diverse communities, actually a third of the artists that were involved in our signature events actually identify um, as uh, within culturally and linguistically diverse communities, and young people who of course are within um, some of the most uh, vulnerable of our communities. We have seen considerable growth of Pride March over the last couple of years at a pretty significant rate. So 2016 reached record March attendances of 5,000, but last year that grew to 6,000 people, with um, an estimated 45,000 people lining the streets, in cafes, in bars, uh, watching the event along the route. It's a very highly visible and high-profile event. Um, we actually did achieve TV coverage on every uh, commercial TV station last year. And the Street Traders Associations in Fitzroy and Ackland Street have told us that it is one of the biggest days for them, if not the biggest trading day for them of the year. But the event, because of its scale, um, is not without its challenges. Um, and this is particularly relevant in an environment of increasing public safety concerns um, for public gatherings and outdoor events. Um, we have been facing increasing requirements, um, initially from council itself, but also from police, for obvious reasons, um, addressing issues of public safety. Um, at an event like ours, of course, that's really important for us as well, to be seen, to be addressing concerns and taking every avenue that we can for safety measures um, for that event. With all the goodwill in the world um, and thorough planning, and there is inherent difficulties in sustainability of our abil ability to meet those increasing demands every year um, for a not-for-profit like ourselves. Um, we see our relationship with the City of Port Phillip very much as a partnership. 
Um, and it's an important one for us to continue to see Pride March in Fitzroy Street alive every year. So um, we will help continue to work very hard to bring this event to the highest standards and raise in excess of $200,000 ourselves for this event. Um, but we, we, we seek um, your help to help bridge the gap that still exists to meet the needs of the event each year. And we hope that we're able to do that together um, and that you can view our submission positively in light of the very new very real need for us to be able to ensure the security of the event in St Kilda every year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Bryant. Um, I'd like to ask Mr Bill Garner, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to speak in support of uh, Peter Holland's submission requesting $15,000 for a public consultation with regard to Brooks Jetty. It's good to see Brooks Jetty is actually on the agenda. Um, but we've learned a lot in the last 18 months since it was demolished. We now know that there is an enduring sense of loss of a delightful, unique public space. It was part of the character of St Kilda Beach and it offered a very special promenade out into the bay over the water, remembered with great affection by, by very many residents and visitors alike. We now know that it had a very rich social history. Neither the council nor those who, who were distressed by the loss of the jetty knew this until we started researching it. It was a jetty that played a part in the lives of generations of people and continued to do so to the day it was torn down against residents' wishes and under police protection. We now know that in every design of the foreshore from the 1930s onwards, Brooks Jetty was one of two arms that defined St Kilda Beach, the pier and Brooks Jetty. One of those arms is now gone. It has been a site of pleasure, great pleasure and comfort in many cases to people since 1910 or so. Uh, it's as old as Luna Park and has given pleasure of its own sort. Um, and I might say that the pleasure that it's given has always been free. The demolition at the time was opportunistic. The reasons given for it that were largely accepted by the previous council uh, were uh, reasons that do not stand up to close examination. Um, one reason given by Parks Victoria was that the jetty no longer had a port function uh, because boating was not allowed. Brooks Jetty never had a significant port function. It was always a promenade for people visiting the beach for fishing, swimming, uh, meditating actually, um, jumping off and so on. Uh, it's unfortunate that in many ways the previous council abdicated its responsibility with regard to Brooks Jetty and accepted what it was told by Parks Victoria. Historically, the jetty had always been a shared interest between instrumentalities such as the Melbourne and Metropolitan Board of Works, now Melbourne Water, and the local council. And but for an oversight with respect to changes of regulations in, uh, in heritage protection, it would have been uh, locally uh, heritage protected. That would have been a powerful case against its demolition. Uh, it needs to be known that the jetty has actually been rebuilt several times in its lifetime uh, as, a, as a result of storm damage. So the fact that it has been demolished once again does not mean that it cannot be rebuilt. Uh, we've discovered, we now know from research, that Brooks Jetty was no more inherently dangerous than any other jetty in the bay. In fact, it saved many lives. It was only to justify the demolition that fear about safety was ratcheted up to obliterate all considerations of social value. The bitter irony is that the demolition has increased the danger, not decreased it as young people are now jumping and diving from the drain into much shallower water 
and we have reports of injuries. Mr Garner, can you come to the end, please? Yes. Above all, we can now see plainly that we've been, what we've been left with, the most popular beach in Victoria, the greatest attractor of people to the city of Port Phillip, the site of millions of dollars of investment by this council that once boasted a popular and pretty little jetty is now decorated with an ugly concrete drain. This is not a sustainable situation. Sooner or later, Brooks Jetty is going to be rebuilt and it'll, it'll be necessary to recover the character of the beach and the foreshore and is required under the urban design framework which the council has signed off on. So the question becomes replaced with what and by whom. Council has taken one small step, thank you for that. But don't just shuffle this off to the side. Take the lead, spend some money, engage the public, begin a discussion about the new jetty, keep taking it up to government and to Parks Victoria and to Melbourne Water. In other words, Madam Mayor and Councillors, we hope that you'll jump in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Garner. I'd like to um, call Mr Angelo Indovino, please. And I believe you have a presentation. If you could turn on the microphone and state your name and suburb, please. Madam Mayor, Councillors, my name is Angelo Indovino. I'm a member of LIVE in the city of Port Phillip. And I got this very brief presentation on smart blocks which is a concept to make uh, apartments more efficient and uh, more sustainable. It's a concept the uh, City of Melbourne and the City of Sydney um, trying to make it take off in a fast and uh, significant manner. Uh, we would like the City of Port Phillip to adopt uh, this uh, concept and proposal. Um, how do I move slides? Okay, the project uh, in its simplicity uh, we're implementing it in our building at uh, 183, 173 City Road. Um, two buildings, one body corporate. Next slide. Uh, there's a lot of uh, lighting, car park, ventilation, air conditioning, lifts, garage doors, a lot of electrical equipment which uh, composes the electricity bill. Next slide. Uh, through monitoring and uh, action, we've been able to reduce uh, energy consumption in this uh, block. Uh, from 140,000 and down to around 80, which is a 43% reduction worth $120,000 per year. It's not just the cost reduction in the bill, electricity bill, but the CO2 emissions, which this represents, because electricity is carbon burning in Latrobe Valley. And uh, the idea is to do this kind of thing in more buildings in Melbourne. Just imagine the financial benefit and also the environmental benefit, if we can do that. Uh, it doesn't just stop with electricity, it also applies to gas, water and other things, but let's start with some things. So our proposal is to um, employ more resources, City of Port Phillip, uh, leave us prepared to work with your resources to implement this, uh, inviting owners, corporation managers to find people within their entity to work with us and uh, implement simple projects like uh, lead lights, variable speed fans and the simple ideas which uh, can have a great impact. So that's our proposal. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Indovino. Um, Mr. John Perkins, please. Thank you, councillors, for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, like Mr. Garner, I also want to refer to the Brooks Jetty. Um, the council plan envisages a, a design, uh, plans to design and undertake a community consultation for a replacement structure that meets safety obligations and heritage uh, issues. And we have, as suggested, uh, submitted a proposal that the council allocate $15,000 to undertake this design of the community consultation. <coughs> I'd like to note that uh, as a member of the Brooks Jetty Group, I've investigated several possible structures which I think would be appropriate, and I'd like to draw your attention to an option that I think is particularly relevant, and that is uh, a jetty which is constructed with a lower platform for swimming attached to the main structure. And there is an example of such a jetty in Rockingham in, in Western Australia. 
And the nature of that jetty is a robust, durable, modular design, much of which can be prefabricated. The, uh, the purpose of having the, the lower jetty for swimming is that it, 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 it solves the safety issues which were previously raised as an objection to the, the previous jetty. And I think there's, there's several advantages uh, in this type of structure. Uh, it provides uh, a facility for swimmers, an attraction to the area. It, 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 uh, and I, I believe that uh, the St Kilda Life Saving Club could also be involved with any supervision that's required of it. A facility for swimmers would be very much in keeping with the ambience of the Lunar Park just for fun atmosphere. Uh, it is a prime location that, lead, that needs more than just a drain at that location. And I think having this uh, a public facility for swimmers uh, would provide an additional amenity that uh, the, would be in addition to the amenity provided by the promenade, which was so valuable, uh, that was there before. I'd like to note that... Um, Parks Victoria is not just responsible for maintaining the interests of boat owners in the bay and the, and the seas around Victoria. It does have a public obligation to look after uh, the health of citizens and so it's not within their... It's within their remit to be able to um, uh, provide this facility. The... In particular, I'd like to note the jetty that was designed uh, in Western Australia was designed by a group called MP Rogers and Associates, and I have been in communication with that group, and uh, the Mr Rogers happens to be here in July and will visit the site. So in regards to the design and undertaking the, of the community consultation, I'd like to recommend that uh, this group... Rogers and Associates could provide valuable input in, in providing uh, information for the community consultation and provide options for the public to consider as to what uh, could be built there. And if any further information is required uh, on that uh, contact, I'm w willing to provide it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Jenkins Perkins. Mr Perkins. Um, Mr Gary Mink, please. Hi, Mr Mink, if you could just state your name and suburb, please, for the record. Hello. My name is Gary Mink. Uh, I have a business on uh, Shakespeare Grove in St Kilda, and I'm f I live in uh, Bentley. Um, I recently uh, wrote a letter to Mr Smith uh, which in turn has become treated as a, as a late submission uh, for um, requesting some additional financial support for the new plaza on Ackland Street that should be considered uh, for this budget. Um, Ackland Street, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, and as, as well known to most people, is the business has been declining for a number of years. The decline has accelerated over the last six months with a large number of vacancies. Actually, there's a large probability that any one of the shops that any of you would have enjoyed in the last six months probably doesn't exist anymore. We're seeing a lot more holes on the street. It's no coincidence that the acceleration in vacancy closely parallels the introduction of the plaza or the tram stop on Ackland Street. What makes this even more painful is that the plaza and the tram stop projects did not have majority support from either traders or residents. Council and PTV thrust the project upon the community and it appears its fundamental support base was derived from future development plans. However, I'm not here to debate that project at all. Regardless of how it's spun, the traders are now becoming additional collateral damage. If council is concerned with the traders, which I expect they are, um, and its intent is to help the traders association minimize continued damage and the traders continued damage, activations of public spaces, as we know, is critical to promoting visitation and street vibrancy. The plaza, more so than any other public spaces in COPP, is unique in the fact that it is so closely aligned and so closely integrated with the shops on Ackland Street. Therefore, it requires more attention. It's also new, so it still hasn't really fulfilled a lot of its promises. I do realize we're in the early days. 
I guess to, to talk in, in layman's terms, if the plaza looks dead, the street looks dead. If the plaza looks lively, the street looks lively. It's a two-way street. To end, I'd like to thank Council for providing some funding that provided for plaza activation activities through December. The Ackland Street Traders worked with Council to support many of these activities, as well as we put on a number of our own activities. If Council pulls back in this budget support for plaza activation, and I'm not talking about just keeping it clean and keeping it safe for the, for the hood, but I'm talking about activation, we will not be able to do it alone, meaning the association, because we just, one, don't have the budget as, as everybody, but it's also not in our charter to spend the money on the plaza. So in short, again, on behalf of the Ackland Street Traders Association, I'd like to request additional financial support for the new plaza on Ackland Street be considered in the upcoming budget. Thank you. Thank do, you very much, Mr. Mink. I do have one question. Can I get this included in the minutes, the transcripts of this question? Um, that typically doesn't happen, but the, uh, it's on camera, so you can listen to it in 48 hours again. True, but if I want it to be part of the minutes, I can't get it to be part of the minutes? Um, your submission can be taken as, as part of um, the submissions, which... The I, I, I realise that, but we, I'm asking... So specifically, these cannot be put into the minutes of this meeting? Um, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mink, yes. got Mr. Chick coming to give me advice. Hang on one moment. Through you, Madam Mayor, I'm, I'm advised we would do a, a summary um, of, of the comments and include those in the minutes. So we can do a summary? Yeah. Uh, okay. We'll make sure there's a summary through you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Love, Jeffrey Love, please. Uh, Jeffrey Love of St Kilda, I remain. Um, Mayor Voss, councillors and officers, thanks for this opportunity to address this, ca this council on its first draft budget. Um, if you'll indulge me, I'm listed to speak to items five and seven. Uh, I won't be going over time, but uh, I could address all of those questions in this if given a little latitude. Okay, well... I think that's, that's okay. Yep. Um, they're all related <clears throat> to, you guessed it, flooding. Uh, EFLAG has been making budget submissions arguing for increased budget allocations for drainage and flood mitigation for four or five years. We are pleased to note that this council has responded by increasing the drainage budget by some 30% and thank the council for hearing our pleas. I also note this council's response to our call for a moratorium on sealing laneways in flood prone areas and considering permeable surfaces as an alternative to hard paved surfaces. EFLAG is also encouraged by the endorsement of the Memorandum of Understanding between the four Elster Catchment Councils and Melbourne Water, and the matters detailed in Report 5, Elster Creek Catchment Report and Stormwater Management Response. I wish to stress that it is urgent and important for Council to develop a radical risk management master plan that encompasses retreat, adapt and defend strategies in preparation for a future of increasing catchment and coastal flooding. Uh, report 7, Risk Management, uh, confirms the high risk to residents from climate change. In particular, I would like to note that Melbourne Water has spent tens of millions of dollars on tide barriers or tide gates at Patterson Lakes, uh, which it operates 20 to 30 times a year. We have been urging similar protection for Elwood residents for some years as the single most effective and immediate protection from coastal flooding. We urge this council to advocate to Melbourne Water the urgent need for such protection uh, and we remain willing partners with Council uh, in pursuit of those objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Love. 
Um, so I'll take your name off the other two. Yep. Thank you very much, Mr. Love. Um, Minnie, Minnie Christof Christophicus, please. Minnie Christophicus, uh, Byron Street, Elwood, also from Elwood Flood Action Group. I have just two simple questions that support uh, Jeff's um, presentation, and they are very self Elwood centred. <laughs> what is proportionately the um, budget allocation in drains, maintenance and infrastructure upgrading for Elwood and what is the percentage increase for Elwood compared to the rest of the municipality in that budget allocation? Thank you, uh, Ms Christophicus. We will have to take that one on notice. Thank you. Um, Mr Isaac Herman, please. Isaac Herman from one of the flood zones in Elwood. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, councillors, um, it's nice to see new face and new CEO, very welcome, um, and council officers. Um, drawing from my recent council plan and budget submission, I would like to emphasise my following action plan concerns. Could Council direct three potential sources of revenue specifically to new open spaces incorporating water sensitive urban design and flood mitigation measures? Um, these sources may be one, revenue from laneway sell offs, two, developers' open space contributions, and a drainage development contributions plan similar to Bayside's amendment C139. I repeat, Bayside's planning amendment C139. I'd like to suggest that extreme flood prone properties may be needed to be bought and added to our parkland. Um, uh, further, um, I'd want to um, suggest um, perhaps Council could refrain from selling our pitched urban water courses otherwise known as laneways, in or near to flood zones. Um, please further your attempt to reduce stormwater runoff by locating and targeting perhaps thousands of square metres of bitumen surfaces that are not required for traffic purposes and transform them into water sensitive urban design oriented open space. Um, for example, if you have a look at a, a quarter of Tide Street, could be reverted to parkland. Um, and perhaps much of Broadway as well in Elwood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Herman. Mr Jack Halliday, please. Madam Mayor, <coughs> councillors, Mr Smith, very welcome and officers. I'm Jack Halliday of Albion Street, Balaclava, and I'm speaking for the Port Phillip Alliance for Sustainability. The Alliance was formed just over two years ago with representatives from a number of organisations in Port Phillip concerned about climate change. At the time, there was concern being felt about Council's lack of progress in meeting its objectives under the Towards Zero program, originated in 2007. By 2014-15, it was going to take Council until the year 2052 to meet its 2020 target of zero emissions from its own building stock. And as far as community emissions went, it made very little headway. Since 2007, Council has had to purchase increasing amounts of green power to meet its annual targets for its own emissions, including as recently as 2015-16, rather than being able to meet these targets from its own efforts. It's great to see more transparency, transparency since last month in the CEO's report, tabulating for the first time both gross and net council emissions. We welcome the staff appointments in sustainability since late 2015, and we're also pleased that six of the nine new councillors give high priority to climate change issues. There are parts of the plan and budget we strongly support, 
as we described when the plan was released, but there are three main ongoing concerns we wish to express. First, many key areas of the plan are still vague and marked by expressions like investigate, undertake, increase, examine, etc. We'd like to see the plan tighten around identifiable and measurable targets. Secondly, we don't believe that adequate resources have been committed to the tasks ahead. Capital budgeting for building retrofits for 2017-18 and subsequent years is lower than in 2016-17. An amount of $110,000 is earmarked towards environment performance contracting, and we hope that these funds can be utilised to bring into reality an energy performance contract or contracts, which, been, which we've been advocating to Council over the past couple of years to enable strong reductions in its own emissions. And the final issue concerns community emissions and the operating budget, where the operating budget proposes an amount of $300,000 next year towards community action plan implementation. It's unclear how these funds will be applied, but we have for some years been proposing that Council should be establishing an energy foundation similar to those in Moreland and Yarra. The process of reducing community emissions is complex and difficult especially in a city like Port Phillip with most of its dwelling stock comprising multi-unit dwellings. And we think the Council should be thinking about whether the tasks involved can be better carried out by an entity at one removed from the Council itself, analogous to the Echo Centre, if you like. Historically and culturally, Council perhaps has an orientation towards carrying out its sustainability tasks in-house. This may not always be the most effective means and we hope Council will give close attention to the best way forward for Port Phillip. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Halliday. Um, Helen Halliday, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And um, also I'd like to uh, uh, welcome the new CEO. Um, Jack and I are not going to... Uh, do a tag game here because <laughs> he's, well, we are really. Uh, he's doing environmental issues, concentrating on energy, and um, tonight I'm, uh, needless to say, talking about water, which won't surprise anybody. Uh, water and density. Um, I, I've uh, selected those two topics because it seems to me that um, the draft council plan provides um, a great opportunity to refocus on um, what I believe are the major issues facing the city and um, as we well know climate change is one of them but the second one I think is um, dens densification and um, the Mayor and I are both on a committee which is dealing with um, Fisherman's Bend um, which is probably the area which is um, most likely to take um, increased population density. Tonight we've heard from a, a range of people all talking in their various ways about um, the pressure that is on our municipality, the need that we have now to increase our open space and in fact the, there is a nexus between open space, water and density. An open space is the uh, manifestation I believe of, or the pressure on open space is the manifestation of both those other things. I would like to talk specifically about the um, proposal that's been put in the budget in relation to uh, Albert Park Lake. I believe that um, that needs to be reconsidered in the face of um, what I think is a better proposal, which is that uh, we need to consider open space, connectivity, walkways, uh, local parks, regional parks and um, sub-regional parks. And all of those require a linked program which the council needs to, to look at um, very carefully as a whole of council operation. You have the opportunity, you've got the staff. We have a situation where very large areas, even of our existing municipality, in the, and that's around the central part of St Kilda, is severely deficient in any kind of open space. We would like to re the council to reconsider the way it thinks about all of these issues 
and to come up with a comprehensive plan. There's a lot of um, issues, um, and we've already heard some of them, about Elstonwick Park North, which has got the opportunity for the conversion of a golf course into a urban, an urban forest. We, we would press upon the council that even though it's slightly outside our municipality, it's now been there for over 100 years, and every time the issue comes up, uh, Bayside or Brighton says, well, we don't really need to worry because really the, the, the main service that it provides is to the city of, at that time, St Kilda. So, um, so these large regional spaces are an opportunity and a focus by this council on open space and water. Bringing the two together um, would be, I think, a major step forward for the residents. And um, tonight's meeting indicates, uh, I think, the importance that residents place on their open space. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Halliday. Um, Brenda Forbath, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Councillors. Brenda Forbath Elwood, and I'm speaking to the Community Alliance of Port Phillip uh, submission. There are two main points arising from the CAP submission that uh, I just wish to emphasise tonight. I don't intend to go into all of the detail, obviously, in the time allowed. Um, and that detail is contained in the submission. The first point I want to emphasise relates to the Port Phillip Housing Trust and the Port Phillip Housing Association. The council plan does not provide for any further 10-year um, or even five-year agreement with the Port Phillip Housing Trust and the Port Phillip Housing Association to allocate a fixed monetary amount for the development of social and community housing. This is unfortunate. You're all aware, I'm sure, that previous councils um, were committed to an annual grant of $400,000 per annum over 10 years, which together with the ability to uh, leverage loans uh, using properties in the ha Port Phillip Housing Trust resulted in a very successful housing program. And that housing program has drawn uh, national acclaim uh, throughout Australia. The agreement came to an end, as you know, in 2016. So instead what we have um, is an annual allocation of $500,000 uh, that will be the subject of an expression of interest process, as we understand it. Now, as far as I'm aware, no such expression of interest process has taken place, and there is now uh, $1 million sitting in reserves, as I understand it, from 2016-17 financial year and the 2017-18 budget which has been considered tonight. And that money could be being used to create actual housing units. We're very concerned that this money will be used for employment of staff within the council and will be used for other purposes. It may be related to housing but not actually being used directly for the creation of housing units and it should be being put to work now for the development of housing. So councillors need to be asking um, themselves uh, about the use of this money and the need to ensure that it's being used directly um, for the development of housing rather than any other purpose. And we say that there is a model in place that has worked over a 10-year period and the funds, um, $500,000 now per annum, should go to the Port Phillip Housing Trust to create more housing. We also say in our submissions 
um, that another 500,000 should be allocated for the expression of interest process to test whether other not-for-profit housing groups can achieve the same level of success in creating housing that has been demonstrated uh, by uh, Port Phillip Housing Trust and Port Phillip Housing Association so successfully over the last 10 years. The second issue uh, that we, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to from our submission is the, um, uh, the need for council to assure the community that its aged care services and its childcare centres and services will not be privatised, whether to a non-profit or a for-profit organisation. It's important that Port Phillip Council rejects this element of the neoliberal agenda, which has proven to be so damaging in many areas of our society. Our submission addresses that matter uh, in more detail, and thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms Forbath. Mr Les Rosenblatt, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm Leslie Rosenblatt, um, Secretary of the Community Alliance of Port Phillip and resident of Canal Ward. And I'd like to um, say welcome to the new CEO, Mr Peter Smith. Um, I wish to speak to the um, Community Alliance of Port Phillip submission. Um, the section of the Community Alliance of Port Phillip submission on the Council Plan and Budget with, which deals with housing affordability and homelessness on pages five and six of our submission raises several matters of concern which we detail in those pages. But as we state, our primary concern is that we can find no predicted increase in social housing as a percentage of the city's housing stock from its most recently estimated 7.2%. I wish to stress that CAP's formal policy is that the proportion of social housing dwellings in the city of Port Phillip should actually be increased over the next eight years to a target of 10%. Even though this is not specifically mentioned in our submission, it is certainly intended by us as a reasonably achievable benchmark which should be adopted by the Council in its plan. As Brenda Forbath just mentioned, um, another policy of CAP with relevance to our submission on housing is that CAP wishes to see Council double its cash contribution to the In Our Backyard program from the 500000 per annum to a $1 million per annum over the 10-year funding arrangement. This would enable, as Brenda mentioned, Council to continue to adequately fund the highly successful Port Phillip Housing Association and Port Phillip Housing Trust as well as any of the new strategic directions Council intends to take, such as I mentioned in the new CEO's report tonight. I thought it useful to state these matters in clear and succinct terms tonight in case they are not prominently discernible in the complexity of detail raised in our formal submission. I'd like to say that CAP's submission covers many aspects of Council's plan and budget and we are fully committed to both the breadth and depth of the topics we have covered, as well as being fully supportive of the representations made by the Port Phillip Alliance for Sustainability in its submission on Council's sustainability plans and budgets. I. Um, I think that uh, the Community Alliance of Port Phillip looks forward to a meeting sometime in the near future with the new CEO, Mr Peter Smith, to build up a constructive working relationship. And finally, I'll, I'll conclude with saying that I, I don't envy any of you 
councillors um, to try, or, or the officers of the council, to try to accommodate uh, in a mere fortnight, which is what you appear to have allowed, um, all of the submissions you've received on the plan and budget when the government allows you um, a period of two months before finalising these matters. You're going to try and deal with all these submissions. Your officers are going to try and interpret all of this in a, a mere two weeks and come up with a series of recommendations. I think you're putting yourself in a very difficult situation. But that's your decision. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Rosenblatt. Um, Ms Tamara Jungworth, please. Uh, good evening, Tamara Jungworth, resident of St Kilda and director and CEO of Gasworks Arts Park in Albert Park. Thanks for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, Gasworks Arts Park is in the west end of the city of Port Phillip and uh, we, we offer performing arts, visual arts and outdoor events for our community. In the west end of London there's a lot of theatre and in the west end of the city of Port Phillip there is Gasworks Arts Park. Um, focusing on the theatre buildings themselves, um, we're very grateful for the uh, renovations that Council have supported and those renovations are fast coming to a conclusion. Um, just today I, I saw the hoardings, some of the hoardings come down and some of the electricians continue on with their work and painters and locksmiths and plumbers etc etc so in in a number of short weeks we will get to the end of that work and that work is to really support the performers and the audiences um, in the enjoyment of theatre in the west end of the city of Port Phillip and what I will um, state this evening is that inside our larger of two theatres rests uh, our dilapidated theatre seating um, that has been there for the last 25 years and so it has well and truly served its time and I think it's de been depreciated twice over. Um, and also very grateful for the agreement we've reached with the City of Port Phillip to fund the replacement of those seats with much more modern, flexible seating that can allow us to do uh, interesting theatrical work as well as other community events in the space and offer our visitors comfort and safety and the only the only thing with that agreement is that there is a gap currently in the council uh, budget of uh, one year uh, in that the funds have been allocated to the 2018-19 financial year so as we as we celebrate the, um, the the wonderful upgrades to the theatre buildings we are going to be asking people to sit on threadbare and uncomfortable seats um, unless Council can um, bring itself to, uh, to favour us once, once again and close that gap and so that our visitors will be able to enjoy um, their theatre experience in, in safe and comfortable and presentable seating. So we have uh, uh, issued um, or offered a written submission on this subject and uh, I'm just here today to support that submission. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Jungworth. Um, Mr. James McAfee, please. A mere act of theatre. <laughs> looking, for, looking for sympathy. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> uh, good evening. You know, I'm fine. I just tripped over something. Thank you. Oh, no, um, thank you very much, Councillor Goss. Madam Mayor, Councillors James McCachie, 39 Canterbury Road, Middle Park, Chairman of the Gasworks House Park. I should speak very briefly. Tamara has spoken well. I'd just like to add, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> um, one or two things. We speak in the context of profound gratitude to Council for their investment in the park and in the theatre building. It hasn't been easy for Council to do it. It's had its challenges for us. The outcome is going to be terrific. 
we are deeply appreciative that on top of that, Council has been open, to, has understood the need to replace the seating. I'd like to add just one other dimension to what Tamara said. What we really want to do now is to welcome the public back into this publicly funded space. Um, what is a theatre space? It is actually just a public space which can have many, many different activities. It can welcome the public in different ways. Sometimes it's theatre, sometimes it's circus, sometimes it can be an exhibition, a community event, or things that people just hire for their purposes. All those ways say, this space belongs to you. In it, we will from time to time do interesting things that we hope also interest you. That act of welcome comes most crucially as the building is opened. And we say, this is what Council's done. Come and have a look. If we can get going one year earlier, sooner, with this retractable seating, it's important to say it's not just new flash seating. By being retractable, you, take, you can empty the space in a matter of minutes. It becomes become a, a glorious flat spore with a wide span suitable for social events, um, exhibitions, a whole range of things which people can hire the space for, make their own. So we just hope we know the competitive environment we're in. We've only had to keep our ears open tonight to know the challenges facing council. But if you could consider bringing that forward as a summons, you know that we will be repaying over the years. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr McAfee. And hope you're OK. <laughs> um, now we've got Mr. Bradley Mullen, please. Hello, Mr. Mullen. If you could just state your name and suburb, please. Press that. It's already on. I'm Bradley Mullen. I'm from Craigieburn, Victoria. And I want, I've just got a question in regards to um, the funding for the budget for um, Northport Oval. Um, look, my question, my question, basically, I, I, what I want to say is. Northport Oval is probably the premier um, AFL ground in um, Port Phillip Council in terms of um, its facilities. It's, it's got four change rooms, which is catered for women as well. Um, in, terms, in terms of um, the crowds and that, the Port Melbourne get, um, during the finals, some crowds can be up to 8,000. Most of them are visitors to the city, including myself. Um, so my, what my question is, is basically um, over the past probably five years, the ground, we've had a lot of difficulty um, that in terms of attending games, supporters like me attending games, they've been cancelled due to the ground having been waterlogged and things like that, and, and games have had to be moved at the last minute. Um, moving ahead, um, in terms of, I just want to ask the question, is... The, is there going to be money in the budget are coming to resurface the ground in terms of flat, making it you know, um, very flat, have a great drainage, and basically um, not have that worry on the football club that games could be changed at the last minute because it's, it's very frustrating as a supporter to hear on a Friday afternoon that a game has been moved from City of Port Phillip to, for example, in 2013, a game was, was shifted from from Northport Oval to Box Hill in less than 24 hours' notice. So just, yeah, basically just want to know if the, the ground's going to be updated. Um, and, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, um, Mr Mullen. Um, you have many of your supporters um, have put in submissions around that, so the information will come back out, be, uh, let us be sent directly. And our last speaker tonight is Mr Stephen Main, please. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. Um, I'm here on behalf of the um, Gambling for the Alliance for Gambling Reform, um, and actually, Mr. Mullins's presentation uh, is is relevant. Um, we are a group uh, with Tim Costello on the board, uh, Jeff Lake as as chair, uh, Kelvin Thompson's working with us. Uh, we're a broad group. Uh, which is aiming to reduce the scourge of, of gambling losses. Australia at 23 billion a year is the world's biggest gamblers per capita. Um, in City of Port Phillip, you've got 28 million being soaked out of your uh, residence um, each year uh, from your 10 venues. And unfortunately, the, uh, the Port Melbourne Footy Club's Rex Hotel is one of the two biggest at uh, about 5 million a year. 
Uh, the other big one is the Balaclava at $6 million a year, and both of those venues are operated by Woolworths in their partnership with Bruce Matheson, and they are the most brutal and effective operators of poker machines venues. When you put them in charge, their numbers are really high. They really know how to get them in, get them back, milk them dry in many cases. So we're arguing that it's time for significant reform, uh, and we'd love to see Port Phillip uh, on board. We have all the other inner metro councils uh, as tier one members, so Yarra, Moreland, uh, Darabin and Melbourne have all joined as tier one members of the alliance. Uh, many of the outer suburban councils which have got the highest pokies losses like Wyndham and Whittlesea and Dandenong are also tier one members uh, entering at the highest level. So we are wanting to run a really big campaign leading into the 2018 state election to encourage both sides of politics to put up serious reform. Serious reform, $1 bets, reduced hours, sinking lids. So in Canberra, for instance, they've just announced they're going to reduce their pokies numbers by 20% over the course of their parliament and their local elections. So we want to see those sorts of policies introduced here. But to get that, we need across-the-board support. We, we need you know, councils that have got broad political representation, and Port Phillip is one of those, to get on board as a whole united council and to say, we want to see some change. So your residents, particularly in St Kilda and the live music scene, would love to see you doing some really heavy stuff. At 28 million, we know you're not in the top uh, 20 in the state, but your residents would love to see it reduced. And if, if, if we can get together, we would love to campaign directly. So on the Port Melbourne Footy Club, I went down to Northport tonight. I had a look at the boys' training before I popped into the Rex. And uh, it's a beautiful ground. And I think there's a lot of work you could do with the Port Melbourne Footy Club to get them out of the pokies as part of an upgrade or redevelopment. So Darabin Council just on Monday night passed a resolution saying they weren't going to support the Northcote Park Footy Club anymore uh, unless they got out of the pokies. So these are the sorts of policies that councils can look at. There are many pokies venues on council-owned land, uh, but the business just sort of goes on and it's not on the political radar uh, particularly. So. Um, we'd just love to see, um, see your support. New South Wales is a lost cause. You know, it's just clubs New South Wales just dominate. And Victoria can lead, but we just need uh, your support uh, to promote your policies, to work when their planning applications come in. There hasn't been a lot of activity in Port Phillips since C88 back in 2011, which was a really good planning amendment that you did. Uh, so you haven't had high-profile recent disputes. As, are, as there are you know, quite regularly around Victoria. But I think you're a leadership council, you're a vibrant uh, arts community, and your community would love to see you doing things. We'll get the core flutes up, we'll get the messages out. We can do things that councils can't do as a campaigning organisation. We can work with the academics, um, we can do all sorts of things, and we just need some resourcing and we just need some support and the perception that we've got a lot of councils on board, 20 are on board, but Port Phillip's not. So you can come in at Tier 1, which would be great, or you can pick any number you like. We'd love your support and just to have it out there that the city of Port Phillip, the great city that it is, is on board with all its other colleagues in the inner city metro councils, uh, resourcing up the alliance for a really strong campaign to, to, to get some progress on pokies in particular, but also on sports betting and online gambling, which is now at $38 billion a year globally, and the other dangerous areas of this industry. Finally, we are the world's best in terms of smoking. We've got the lowest smoking rates in the world. How can the same society, with another dangerous addictive product, have the worst rates in the world for gambling with the most lethal and addictive machines in the world? You go to Vegas, you go anywhere, you haven't got the sorts of lethal machines like we have here. So we need the $1 bets, which Coles has committed to, but Woolies and Mr Matheson won't. Mr Matheson's an old Port Melbourne boy. It would be really symbolic to have his local council coming in, backing its old mayor, St Kilda Mayor Tim Costello, and sending a message about this industry has to change. It's just doing too much damage across society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Main. We've had one more person put their name up. Uh, Mr Chris Davey, please. Uh, 
Uh, my name's Chris Davey. I live in Hawthorne, and I'm the secretary of the South Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Our submission essentially seeks a continuation and reformalisation of our current arrangement, and this has been periodically revalidated through the orchestra's history. In essence, it's an in-kind grant that allows us the use of the South Melbourne Town Hall uh, for our Monday evening rehearsals and our four concerts each year. The submission touches on um, the history of the orchestra since it was formed by the Council in 1946, um, why the South Melbourne Town Hall is the most appropriate location for us, our finances and our relationship with the community. And it's that that I'll focus on for the rest of the time. If two words could probably describe our relationship with the community, they'd be accessibility and symbiosis. Ways these occur include deliberately keeping our ticket prices low to ensure that um, as many people as possible in the community are able to access the concerts if they so choose. Uh, maintaining a good relationship with ANAM where each party has on occasion borrowed equipment from the other when it's been required to augment their own supplies for a special performance. By inviting ANAM students to perform with us as soloists in concertos once a year which both gives them valuable performance experience and allows our audiences to hear exceptionally talented young musicians at the start of their careers. And by engagement uh, with the general community who obviously form our wider audiences and many of our players. Unlike many other orchestras, we don't do auditions. When people contact us to say, can I play, our default position is to say, yes, come along for a few rehearsals, try us out, see if you like us, see if you like the music. Most players find their own level. And whether they stay or they go, everyone comments on how encouraging and supportive the orchestra is. In fact, so much so that in the past and even now, we're into second generation players. I'll talk about one player um, who lived in Lock Street, West St Kilda. He was a member of the second violins and I don't think he'd mind me saying he was a fairly average player. Um, occasionally he found he had to leave bits out that were a bit too difficult. But that didn't diminish his enjoyment of coming to rehearsals, his enjoyment of playing in the concerts, or his enjoyment of being with the other musicians. And there came a time when we programmed the Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony. And this was an ambitious work for all of us, but through the 10-week rehearsal period, we rehearsed it and we gave the performance and it was a great success. And afterwards, David said to other players and to the conductor, never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be sitting in an orchestra playing a Tchaikovsky symphony. And it was one of the highlights of his life. That's what a community orchestra can do for people. This orchestra exists and flourishes because of support from all previous successive councils. And as we turn our thoughts to our 75th anniversary in 2021, and our centenary in 2046. We hope that support continues for a long time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Davey. Councillors, there are no more, no more members of the public that have requested to speak. Um, given that we are hearing submissions, I just will ask councillors, do you have any questions of the officers or are you happy just to think about that? Councillor Pearl? Can I just take up one question regarding the timeline on the feedback that's been received through these submissions? So can the, would the officers please clarify um, the timeline, the, the timeline approach that the council's taken uh, to release the council plan um, and how these submissions will be um, incorporated into that timeline? Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, so tonight we're hearing the submissions, all the submissions in detail have been provided in your information pack. Um, and on the 21st of June, we'll be considering the final council plan. The, uh, we will be providing um, officer responses to all of the submissions and providing you with um, our recommendations, which you'll consider um, when you're finalising the plan, what parts of that you will or won't take on board, uh, what changes you'll make to the document, etc. 
just as a follow up, if I could, just as a follow up in terms of the residual two months that was mentioned in one of the questions about the where um, the perception that we've sped the plan up to submit the plan two months ahead of the deadline that we have to and the statutory requirements. Could you comment on that, please? Through you, Madam Mayor, um, there has been an extension of time. I, th I thought it was a month for the um, submission of the council plan. So if that was to be done separately, but the timeline for the budget is still 30th of June this in this financial year to set for next financial year. And given we're taking the approach of integrating the council plan and the budget together, um, quite innovative for Victoria. Um, but one that we think is a very sensible approach and one that other councils will probably follow. Um, we have to consider that on the 30th of June as well. Thank you. Councillor Baxter. No, Councillor Simic. Oh. <laughs> Any other councillor? <laughs> if not, we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover? Councillor Bond to move. Councillor Gross to second. Councillor Bond, you don't want to speak. Councillor Gross, would you like to speak? I was um, a bit apprehensive about tonight because I thought it would be um, not as it was. I, I was really proud of our city tonight. I, I hope I don't sound like too much of a sycophantic little suck, but I thought, and obsequious, but the range of ideas, it was like suggestion speed dating. And we went from idea to idea to idea, and they all just about resonated with me. We heard about exciting stuff about um, solar collection on um, medium and high density buildings, heard from our um, beloved Midsummer, PPAS, E Flag, CAP, Stephen on the um, gambling. It was, look, I. I suppose I'm a local government tragic, but I actually found it really interesting. I don't know whether all of the ideas will get up. And oh, the Brooks Jetty um, was great. Uh, look, it was all... I found it actually stimulating. And yes, maybe I'm a local government tragic, but I sort of really want to thank you for taking such an interest in producing such an array of information and ideas. And I promise you that... Tonight, um, maybe not everything will get into the council plan going forward, but there are annual reviews, and a lot of those ideas are nestled into my brain and, uh, and, and will eat away over the next little while, and I think that's true of everyone. And, um, you know, just thanks very much for the contribution. I, th I thought it was really actually enjoyable and enlightening and uh, I think it was a really good exercise. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Councillor Baxter. I'd just like to, um, to uh, also thank all the speakers that came here. I know a lot of people will uh, complain about council or all sorts of people have ideas about what council should be doing, but only some people actually make the effort to go ahead and make a submission. Um, and uh, so I'd also like to thank all the people that made submissions. They're not all here, obviously. Um, but to come and speak to it just shows uh, your passion for these sorts of things. So that's uh, really great. So I just wanted to, to give that and I'll try and get the... Um, the thought of ideas eating at Councillor Gross's brain out of my brain, um, and uh, and just let people know that I've taken notes on on what people have spoken about, and we have your submissions, and we will consider them. Thank you. Any other councillor wishing to speak? And I will also um, express. Um, my thanks for all of you coming out and making a submission tonight, and also to the 117 submitters formally and the eight late ones, um, and many of them were very positive um, and just, you know, congratulations or thank you, so as well as uh, a lot asking for, you know, a different focus or more money as well. So um, I think it's been a, a great experience and I look forward to the 21st of June in which we'll be looking at the final submission and endorsing that. So thank you very much. Um, Councillor Bond, would you like to close? Then I'll put that motion. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. All right, we'll go to 8.3, which is the CEO report, um, which is the 30, 
uh, fourth CEO report. Um, for, um, and we don't have anyone that's requested to speak to this report. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? Councillor Simic. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a brief question. Um, on page uh, eight, um, it talks about um, construction continued at the South Melbourne Fry Street School and Community Facilities uh, as one of the items happening in the Gateway Ward. Could uh, officers please just elaborate on progress uh, there? Through you, Madam Mayor, the construction of the primary school is well underway and the school is scheduled to be opening term one, 2018, and there is currently um, tender processes underway and demolition of the, um, the Montague Park site um, so that that will be ready for um, to be made into public space um, in 2018. Thank you, Ms Shenikau. Any other questions, councillors? Councillor Pearl? Uh, a quick question. How will the format of this report change to match the, um, match the council plan when it comes out? And are we doing any plans to change the format of this so it becomes more of a scorecard about how <coughs> this council's tracking and our performance uh, according to the plan once it's released? Mr. Through you, Madam Mayor. I need to have some consultation with the new chief executive on how he'd like his report to look. But uh, in the in the first instance, we are planning to realign the plan to your new council plan once you've adopted it, um, and pro providing great focus on how we're progressing against the six key strategic directions and the and the measures both for the city, the council, and for the organisation um, going forward. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Any other questions, councillors? I've just got a couple on the project portfolio and the updates that um, you're looking at getting endorsement on. Um, first of all, um, the Disability Discrimination Act. There's a request there for additional funding for um, disabled beach access for St Kilda and Port Melbourne Life Saving Club. Just want to clarify is if that's the mat um, that you're talking about. And I did hear quite a few rumours about state government pitching in for that. What, um, what have we done around that, please? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, my understanding is that the state government, that there is, that we have applied for some funding from the state government towards this project. Um, it's currently listed as coming out of the um, DDA compliance retrofit for council facilities. But my understanding is there's discussions internally about whether that can be supported through another program, which is um, our foreshore upgrade and renewals program, and, and what contribution may come from the state. I haven't got confirmation of that though at the moment, but that's the, the general cost there um, for implementing that matting. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, I'm aware there is um, progress in a project regarding the matting. The two sites that we are working with uh, Life Saving Clubs as a St Kilda Life Saving Club, just noting that we've completed that facility with the first change in places facility on our foreshore. Um, so noting that we do have that, we are looking at that temporary facility and an MOU with the St Kilda Life Saving Club. So um, looking to progress that. We're also Port Melbourne Life Saving Club have also expressed interest in um, housing a um, matting structure and in engagement at there. So we are progressing, we're working with them and we're looking at funding to support our initiatives around this um, asset provision. Thank you. And the next, I have a question on the next point as well. Um, the towards zero energy efficiency. So the pro it says the project will no longer install a solar PV unit on the Port Melbourne Town Hall due to the complexity, um, resulting in a forecast underspend, but then it says the project will complete by 30th of June. 
I'm just wanting some clarification on what that means, please. Through you, Madam Mayor. The uh, complexities referred to are relating to uh, the suitability of the roof for solar on the Port Melbourne Town Hall. So we need to work through that before committing to any solar installs. I think the reference to project completion is about the uh, entire the project as a whole rather than that particular element of it. So through you, Madam Mayor, to be clear, my understanding is that that project was more than just putting solar on the roof. There are a range of um, energy efficiency initiatives that were being completed in the town hall. Uh, they, those will still be completed, but the solar um, is not seen as feasible at this point in time. And one last question for me. Um, the ITS, the Integrated Transport Strategy, um, it talks about the scope being extended and that the completion date's now being pushed out by six months to 30th of June 2018. Um, so was, it, was, it was intended to be finished at the end of this year and now it's middle of last year, next year, is that? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, the, um, the project completion date is not it's, it's about the whole integrated transport strategy and it's related to the uh, extent of community consultation that we'll, we'll need to undertake to do that thoroughly and properly. The, um, the Fisherman's Bend Pay Parking investigation we anticipate will... Uh, is, is not a material impact on the overall program but it's part of the program. They're kind of separate, separate matters. Oh, it's inclusive, inclusive but it's not the driving thing. It's the overall community consultation that pushes the timeline out. So Mr Walters, um, if we um, endorse the CEO report tonight, um, will that mean because of the Fisherman's Bend paid parking being put into the scope that the ITS will be delivered in 2018 rather than the end of this year? Through you Madam Mayor, it's a contributing factor to the overall program, but the overall program is most strongly influenced in its time extension by the extent of community consultation we believe we need to undertake to complete the entire strategy. Councillors, any other questions? There's no other questions. Then we have a officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover? Councillor Simic, Council Pearl to second. Councillor Simic, would you like to speak to the motion? Just briefly also take a moment to welcome the new CEO to uh, his first council meeting. It's um, great to have him on board um, and thank uh, outgoing uh, interim CEO for um, compiling and, and working with uh, the new CEO on uh, the report, which we've considered tonight. Um, it is uh, really great that um, we have this level of transparency within our municipality where we can um, have ongoing dialogue with, with our CEO and officers with respect to the council plan and how it's progressing. Um, I take on board the question that Councillor Pearl asked and look forward to seeing how the CEO report in the coming council meetings will integrate into the new council plan which will uh, be signed off at some point soon in the future. Um, but as a whole, I'd like to thank the officers um, for all the work that they're doing in progressing um, the many projects which, which Council's working on, on currently. So thank you very much and thank you. Thank you, Councillor Simic. Councillor Pearl. Just quickly to support the report, this report has the good, the bad and the ugly of the Port Phillip in some respects in it and uh, it shows our commitment to transparency and as a councillor it's extremely useful. So uh, if we can build this up going forward it will be, uh, as, it will be great for us and, and, and a good outcome for our community. So that's it from me. Would any other councillor like to speak? Um, I will also, also like to take the opportunity to formally welcome a new CEO, Peter Smith. And I guess this will be the first of many reports that you'll be doing. Um, I congratulate also um, the officers on, on helping put together this report. It gives a level of transparency. Um, and as Councillor Pearl 
said, the good, bad, the bad, the ugly, everything is here, which is fantastic. We see, we know exactly what's going on, what hasn't happened, what is late, what is on time, what's whatever. And um, I'd, I'd really would like to see, you know, other councils and other municipalities doing the same, the same thing. But um, at any rate, we've got a good report now. It's looking like it's going to get better, so I look forward to that. Um, Council, uh, Council Simic, would you like to close? No? Then I'll put that. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. I'll go to item... Actually. Go to 8.4, um, the City of Port Phillip Draft Reconciliation Action Plan um, for 2017-2019. We have no members of the public that have requested to speak. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? There are none. Um, then we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover or a, uh, do I have a mover? Council Councillor Copsey to move, Councillor Brand to second. Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak to the motion? I will briefly. Um, coming off the back of uh, Reconciliation Week, it's fantastic to see our new Reconciliation Action Plan, uh, plan progressing in the City of Port Phillip. Um, our previous Reconciliation Action Plan was a great document and I look forward to seeing the City take more meaningful steps on the road to reconciliation. I'd just like to note some of the differences between um, the previous wrap and this one uh, and I think there's been a good attempt by officers to put measurable actions into this plan that we can um, see progress against over time. I do have, uh, I should probably have asked this as a question but I, I guess I'll just put it as an um, observation that I see we have annual reporting under the Reconciliation Action Plan which is fantastic. Um, and I think that that's to meet legislative requirements. And I would just note that I think uh, there are people on this council who would be keen to keep a closer eye at than annually. And uh, I'll look forward to, as the years progress, seeing um, reports on some of the great projects that we have forecast under the Reconciliation Action Plan coming to fruition. There is some great actions in there. 2018 in particular looks like it's going to be a busy year and there's some fantastic um, initiatives such as the Indigenous Rangers programs that I'll be really glad to see roll out. So it's a good document um, and I look forward to making sure that we make measurable progress in this really important area. Thanks very much. Thanks, Councillor Copsey. Councillor Brand? Yes, I just would pretty much certainly support everything that Councillor Copsey just said. I just want to, I guess, say the last two or three weeks in this area has been fantastic, very, in a very exciting uh, and um, profoundly interesting time from the Uluru um, statement and through the last, few, uh, last week or two of reconciliation. Uh, the, uh, the events that I've um, attended at Council have been fantastic events and, and full of just fantastic spirit and engagement. And uh, I really look forward to the reconciliation plan, our reconciliation plan, I guess reconciling itself with, with new directions which are being articulated through the statement and, um, yeah, and maybe a new future, uh, another episode in um, the improvement of uh, this difficult, long-standing, profound and distinctly Australian um, situation. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Would anyone else like to speak? No? I'll, I'll real quickly also say um, thank you very much to the officers that have put a lot of work into this new um, Reconciliation Action Plan, but also the previous one, which was quite, quite groundbreaking. Um, we're very appreciative of all the events and everything that, we, that you do for our municipality, and in particular our Indigenous um, community and um, look forward to progressing you know this whole subject of reconciliation much further so we've got a long way to go 
Councillor Copsey, would you like to close? Yes, I think it would be remiss um, to, to close without acknowledging the great amount of engagement that has gone into this document and thank um, some of our fantastic local organisations such as the Boonwurrung Foundation, Port Phillip Citizens for Reconciliation and all the other entities that have engaged with the development of this plan. Um, the path to reconciliation is one that we can only go down together and uh, I thank them very much for helping make this a document that we can move forward with. I will now put that motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. I will move to item 8.5. Um, we have two people that have requested to speak. Item 8.5 is Elster Creek Catchment and the Progress Report. I'll ask Mr Isaac Herman, please, to come forward. You know the drill? <laughs> you might want to put on your mic. Isaac Herman, still from the flood zone in Elwood. Um, firstly, uh, thank you for all your responses to all our letters to date. Um, we look forward to renewed consultations and plans for a drier and safer future. Um, with regard to my Elwood, Venice or Atlantis letter of the 23rd of January of this year requesting advocacy on a number of issues. Um, it seems that there's perhaps one urgent issue that um, requires your timely attention that hasn't been addressed to date, um, and that is in regard to having discussions with South East Water about stormwater to sewerage line infiltration from their own infrastructure, um, and further um, private illegal sewage to stormwater connections um, that it would appear go undetected and unabated. Um, this issue really can't wait any longer. It's essential, um, it's urgent, um, and it, uh, it really needs um, your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Herman. Um, Ms Halliday, please. Ms Helen Halliday. I spoke on um, <coughs> Helen Halliday um, to Albion Street outside the flood zone. Um, I spoke, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, the railway embankment saves us. Uh, um, anyway, I, I spoke previously, so I won't um, take too much time. The Elster Creek catchment, I think, is a very important um, step forward. We've been working for a long time to um, to see a, um, some kind of um, catchment level uh, consideration and integrated water management. We think that that is the way forward, not only in relation to flooding issues, but also in relation to the water quality, because. Um, Return the uh, Elster Creek is, is um, Melbourne's most polluted waterway. The only way that that's going to be retrieved is by a wetland, and that wetland has to be open water, and therefore it has to be in Elston Week Park. As a result of all of that, um, a group of people have been working now for a couple of years across the, um, not only in, in the city of Port Phillip, but also in the city of Bayside. And at the meeting where the future of Elstonwick Park was considered by Bayside Council, um, <clears throat> we didn't get the worst possible outcome, which would have been a third oval. We got the second worst possibility, which is the continuation of, of, of the golf course. The golf course has protected the area and it's also protected um, species diversity, so it's, it's um, not uh, totally... Um, as bad as we could have thought it might have been. We are grateful to Melbourne Water for instigating the, um, and for the City of Port Phillip and Bayside and Glenara and Kingston, I believe, for getting together and supporting a, um, a catchment consideration. This is not the first time this has come up. This is about the 24th time and the earliest time was in 2005. So, um, I'd like to hope that um, because a number of us really believe, um, delusionally perhaps, that we know quite a lot about water, 
we, we at a community level, would hope that the, uh, the council itself would make sure that the community is kept involved, engaged, informed. And we now have a um, coalition made up of all of uh, some 30, 30 odd groups uh, with a steering committee. We're calling it the Alston Wick Park uh, Coalition. And um, it's one of the most diverse, energetic, and well informed groups of people that I've had the pleasure to work with. So we hope that um, that will provide a, um, a way in which the council itself can communicate with the residents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Halliday. Um, councillors, there are no more um, people that have requested to speak to this item. Do you have any questions of the officers? Um, I note there are none. Then we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have that or an alternative? Councillor Gross? May I um, uh, move, suggest and move an, uh, an alt rec, please? Don't know if it's up on the board, but I'll read it. So um, it's. Um, you as, may read it and then we'll see if we've got a seconder. Okay. It's as read 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. And then 1.4 is notes that section 3 capital D2D of the Local Government Act provides that the role of a council includes advocating the interests of the local community to other communities and government, which empowers council's advocacy for the whole of the catchment, and that section 3 capital D2E um, of the Act provides that the role of a council includes, inverted commas, acting as a responsible partner in government by taking into account the needs of other communities. Close inverted commas. And 1.5 calls on all councils in or affected by the Elster Creek catchment to consider the needs of communities in the whole of the catchment, whether those communities who may benefit are in or outside a council's own municipal boundaries. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Baxter. Councillor Gross, you may speak to your uh, motion. Can I, um, uh, may I speak first of all to um, the 1.1, 2 and 3, just to say that flooding has been, as uh, the speakers have um, indicated, uh, a bit of a, um, an issue that uh, has, been, be, has become of necessity a uh, lifelong uh, interest for people who live in that area. Um, but it's now more than that. With climate change looming, with um, the increased densification leading to more impermeable surfaces, the issue is going to increase in urgency and immediacy for people in Elwood. And the primary duty of a council is to make the place safe for its residents. And so that is a statement of the obvious and it's a statement that was um, uh, mentioned in uh, the presentations by the community to us both in the first item and in this item. So that's sort of stating the obvious really. Um, but what we need to progress in this area is a commitment that has been prompted by the community and we have a duty to take that to those organisations which own the assets and um, govern the areas that are outside the purview of this council. So that's, this report basically represents a statement about uh, how this council is on notice that the community is really concerned about this I issue and it's a, a sort of a, a recitation of what we've done so far and the council officers are really on board and really supportive and um, hitherto, you know, council has spoken with one voice. My suggestion of um, 1.4 and 1.5 is about um, how we work with our neighbours. And I just think we have to remind ourselves and our neighbours 
that we are all in this together, but in addition to that, the Local Government Act mandates and empowers all councils to act as a regional catchment body. So the days of being um, small parochial entities which could turn their backs on their neighbours need to be in the past if we're going to have anything to do with uh, uh, that's effective in the way we deal with this uh, catchment issue. And I just say to everyone that Elwood is just the first. We are a coastal council with lots of low-lying land and what happens in Elwood only presages and informs what's going to happen in, in Middle Park and in parts of South Melbourne and in Fisherman's Bend. We really have to be concerned with this issue and on top of it for the next decade or three. And it's not going to go away and it's only going to get worse. These are things that everyone has said to us and I'm just repeating. But I, I feel that these are important because our needs go beyond our borders and our allies are outside, must be outside our borders. And I, I, I think that we have to repeat time and time again to our potential allies that the Local Government Act empowers and mandates that we all work together in Section 3, Capital D. So um, uh, that's all I want to say and just uh, hope, uh, commend this amended uh, alternative motion to you. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Councillor Baxter. Um, thank you, Councillor Gross, uh, for saying um, a, a lot of what I wanted to to say. Basically, actually, yeah. <laughs> I think that um, I think that this is absolutely a, a test case uh, in terms of how we can work with other councils um, to manage a waterway. And obviously, flooding is a massive issue for people that live in Elwood, but. The issue is actually is wider than that as well. It's been touched on by some of the speakers here in regards to water quality, pollution, um, and that's a catchment-wide issue as well as the issue of uh, overdevelopment um, that nearby uh, the catchment and what that can do in terms of permeability and runoff and that sort of thing. So this is something that will need to be tackled uh, at, a, at a higher level, and so I'm... I truly believe we are actually getting to a, getting towards a point where we're where we're going to be able to do things with those other councils uh, in that catchment um, that we have not been able to do before, and we're getting to a place where we're going to be able to work together in a way that we haven't before. So, um, and all of that's really heartening. So, um, I, I uh, personally, um, the 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 addition um, here. Uh, I think is 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 not the the, the most earth shatteringly important thing in the world, but um, it is important to note that um, we we can't just look in on ourselves. We've we've got to work with other councils, and um, that's exactly what we're supposed to do, according to the local government act. So, thank you, Councillor Baxter. Would anyone else like to speak, Councillor Brand? Yes, I'd just like to say um, <clears throat> the. Um the uh, question of um, the Elster Creek is probably, I think it's fair to say, it's the single most prominent issue that for, of the last six months of this council. Um, and I just uh, think this um, proposed motion um, connects the fundamental moral imperative of collaboration across the whole catchment, uh, connects it uh, directly to the Local Government Act uh, very eloquently, and that's obviously exactly what needs to be uh, forced home in in um, the way that this uh, the only way to resolve this issue. So I commend it. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion? If not, uh, Councillor Gross, would you like to close? No, thank you. Then I'll put that motion. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Now, 8.6 Planning Permits Delegate Report, April 2017. We've got no one that's requested to speak from the public. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? We have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a um, mover? Councillor Bond, Councillor Pearl, 
Councillor Bond, would you like to speak, Councillor Pearl? No. no? Would anyone else like to speak? And I will put that motion. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you. Um, 8.7, Risk Management Policy Framework and Strategic Risk Register. Uh, Mr Love's off the list, so we don't have anyone else that have re that's requested to speak. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? Councillor Pearl. One quick question. Uh, this is a critically important document, obviously. Um, 8.16, monitor and review. How will this document be, be stress tested to ensure that it, it should be a living and breathing document, obviously, as the, as the world changes and our standards change? How, how are we going to stress test this document to ensure it's relevant going forward? Mr Carroll? Through you, Madam Mayor. There's a range of... We, we're committed to doing um, an ongoing review of risk throughout the organisation on various various levels. The policy itself is subject to review on a biannual basis every two years. Um, the strategic risk register is something that we will be looking at um, at least on a monthly basis at the executive team with any material changes that are happening both in terms of the external environment, internally, our controls. And, and weaknesses in our controls or failures being reported through the CEO report to you. Um, and similarly, our operational risk register internally is reviewed on a, on a as-needs basis by management. So if something happens, the, we refer to the risk register and, and update it. Alternatively, it happens through ongoing sort of monthly um, departmental uh, review. Um, we continuously have an internal audit program as well. Uh, as part of internal audit, the risk management framework is reviewed um, periodically. Um, I think we've committed to it being done at least every four years, unless it's prudent not to, but the, the, but the um, Audit and Risk Committee can make a decision that, for whatever reason, that needs to be brought forward. Um, we have an internal, we have a internal function, our risk an assurance function which sits in the um, service and business improvement area. Uh, we work closely with external agencies, including the Auditor General's Office, as well as with our internal auditors, PwC, looking at what's happening in the environment around risk, um, what improvements we can make um, to our practices. Sometimes that's just changes in our controls, and sometimes it might result in changes in our policy or our framework. Follow-up question, Councillor Pearl? Um, that's fine. Okay. Um, SR04, which is uh, demographic and economic conditions in the in the strategic risk heat map. I'm just wondering. So under the policy 18.17, you've got legislation, obviously, which is a key issue. One of the things that's concerned me um, since coming on council was there were two bits of legislation: the Residential Tenancies Act and the Rooming House Operations Act. The Residential Tenancy Act review we didn't put a submission in for, and the Rooming House Operation Act, it appeared that the Council wasn't aware that that legislation had come in place, albeit having a, a massive operational, sorry, not operational effect, strategic um, impact on the Council. Um, with this policy now in place, would have those two instances occurred? Through you, Madam Mayor, I'd have to investigate a little bit more of those two instances to to understand exactly what what we did or didn't do. We do try and review most well, we have a our governance function does look at what's happening in the external environment. We are and in, including changes in legislation and we get our report of any legislative changes coming through that goes to management uh, on a regular basis. We don't do submissions to every um, everything that comes past us. We just don't, we simply don't have the resources and sometimes we don't have the time to do it either because the time frames for responding can be very short with little notice in advance of that, that consultation was to take place. I'd have to look back at those two particular instances to, to understand what actually happened and what caused it. Um, we are all the time placing greater focus on legislative compliance and um, in terms of reporting going to the Audit and Risk Committee but also then being shared with the organisation, we regularly review what's happening externally, including the legislative changes, and feed that through to management. 
Councillor Gross. Mr Carroll, I just wanted to have a, a question about the uh, risk management guidelines and particularly um, on page uh, 8 of 37, um, the risk appetite. I just wanted to ask, um, and I'm a member of the audit committee, so I should disclose that, and audit and risk committee. Um, one, of the, one of the conversations around risk management is that organisation becomes so risk averse that they're, that, you know, they're too scared to um, do stuff, they're too inhibited. When I read the um, guidelines uh, earlier on in the risk management framework and it, it didn't sort of um, have that countervailing argument that sometimes uh, uh, an overly conservative concern with risk might inhibit our um, ability to be brave, adventurous or innovative. Is there any way we can... Is that a false dichotomy? And is there any way we could amend the framework, oh, not tonight but in the future, to sort of encourage innovation, change, fearlessness? If I, if I may answer that uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, I've uh, had a particular approach to risk management which manages that tension uh, between strategic risk and opportunity. Uh, the flip side of risk is always opportunity. Um, I've reviewed personally the risk register in the framework is one of the first things I wanted to look at because it can constrain pursuit of opportunity. And there are some practices um, that I'd like to continue to explore with the executive around how we manage that tension a little bit better so that we don't be constrained by an over concentration on risks, but that we manage the big risks properly. And in answer to Councillor Pearl's previous question, I think it, that needs to be a dynamic process where we are picking up contextual changes and managing risk on, on the go. So there's some practices uh, that are probably not picked up in a policy or a framework but around cultural practice and view of risk, which uh, uh, I want to explore going forward. Thank you. Um, I also want to explore a little bit more about the risk appetite. Um, so we're looking here at the policy, the framework, and we've got a strategic risk res register. How do you, um, how does the organisation check in with the councillors about the, uh, you know, the risk appetite and um, how is that then reflected in how things go forward, please, Mr Carroll? Through you, Madam Mayor, the, the risk appetite is a new dimension that we've sort of added into the um, framework policy and strategic risk register in, in this generation of the review. Um, essentially what we're trying to do is take a more measured approach to risk and in part it addresses your point to Councillor Gross around um, knowing how much effort, how much risk we're willing to take and therefore enabling us to take um, advantage of opportunities. So we may not say that everything has to be completely controlled. The risk appetite in this particular circumstance with strategic risk, what we've done is put in a range of measures that sort of indicate as long as we're operating within these measures, we accept um, the risk and the controls that are in place. If we were to operate outside of those measures, and they're, they're, um, we would look to take additional action potentially. Um, in terms of how we communicate with the councillors, we've worked with you in setting up the council plan. We had a look at the external environment and the challenges that we were facing. We also looked at what was happening internally. And as part of developing the council plan, we developed a range of measures which are in your draft council plan. I think the majority, if not all of the measures, but the majority of those measures are now reflected in the, um, in the risk framework and they're actually the definition of the risk appetite. So if we're operating outside of the parameters of the council plan, that would be a trigger to say that we need to take some additional action or bring it to your attention more. Um, tonight, obviously, bringing it to you for your approval uh, is another vehicle if you've got some questions or... Um, and the ongoing reporting that we'll do um, through the CEO report into the future, which will incorporate reporting against the strategic risks at an appropriate level, maybe by exception, 
need to work through that more with the CEO, but they're all potential vehicles for ongoing engagement and discussion with councillors. Terrific. Councillors, any further questions? Then we have an officer's recommendation. Do I have a mover? Councillor Bond to move. Councillor Copsey to second. Councillor Bond, would you like to speak? Councillor Copsey, would you like to speak? Would anyone else like to speak? Councillor Gross. Look, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, this risk assessment that I've encountered in my service with you, Madam Mayor, on the Audit and Risk Committee has been an eye-opener. It's been really, if people could see the, ex the amount of work that goes into trying to um, mitigate risk, it, it'd, it'd knock your socks off. So uh, we've got, but it's not only about paper, and there's a lot of paper involved. There's, you know, an agenda of hundreds of pages. But it's about people, and I think we've got some pretty good people. You know, I've got the trust in our internal auditor, you know. Our officers are, are good and, and great, and, and uh, I look forward to um, the new CEO's uh, input into that. So it's been, the, the risk journey for me has been a real eye-opener. And um, yeah, it's about pa paper, but people. And I think it's going well, but you know, time will tell. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Anybody else? Then I will now put that motion. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. We'll go to item 8.8, .8, fixed asset accounting policy. There's no members of the public that have requested to speak. Councillors. Do you have any questions of the officers? Councillor Bond. Um, does this policy apply to um, fully owned council uh, facilities? And I'm thinking here of the South Melbourne market, um, which is a, a council facility run, managed, owned by, by council. Will it be subjected to this policy? Through you, Madam Mayor. Yes, it will. Do you have a follow-up, Councillor Bond? Okay. Anybody else got a question? Then we have an officer's recommendation, which is one line, <laughs> quite brief. Um, do I have a mover? Councillor Bond? Seconder? Councillor Baxter? Councillor Bond, would you like to speak? Councillor Baxter, would you like to speak? Would anyone else like to speak? No, then I will put that motion. All those in favour? That's carried. Terrific. Okay, 8.9, provision of security patrol services. Again, no one's requested to speak from members of the public. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers? No? And do I have a mover? Council Bond? Council Baxter? Council Bond, would you like to speak? Council Baxter? But anyone else? No? Then I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Uh, 8.10, Assembly of Councillors. Um, again, no one from the public's requested to speak. Councillors, do you have any questions? No. Do I have a mover? Council Bond? Council Baxter? Sir. Um, would you like to speak, Council Bond? No, anyone else? All right, I'll put that. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Um, we... Yes, I was getting to my. Go to item nine. Um, notices of motion, we don't have any. Item 10, reports by Councillor Delegates. Councillors, are there any reports? Councillor Baxter? Uh, yes, I'd just like to report um, from the most recent uh, meeting of the Association of Bayside Municipalities. Um, uh, so we've, um, 
we're moving towards uh, endorsing a uh, the next stage of our Bay Blueprint, uh, which is um, a, a, a huge amount of um, policy and, and, and research that will um, give local councils uh, a, a lot of uh, tools in order to help them plan um, for how they will manage their Bayside assets and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, it's, it's really exciting work there and we also had um, a, uh, a really good discussion about the concerns that a lot of Bayside municipalities have about plastic bags um, and, uh, and two of the councils that are uh, part of the um, ABM uh, have, have uh, put up motions uh, supporting a, a bag on plastic bans um, and a lot of the other delegates to the ABM uh, were, were very supportive um, of, of that ban and they'll be going back to their councils to develop, uh, to attempt to develop some policies around that. So overall, very positive. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Councillor Pearl? Just quickly, um, Councillor um, Crawford and myself um, completed the final community grants assessment panel on the 20, uh, 25th of May. So... Um, They'll be uh, they'll be going out into the categories that have been assessed. Um, there was a wonderful uh, community panel. We have volunteers there that did a an exceptionally um, amazing job. There were probably 13, 14 hours of reading of the assessments, um, and they took it very seriously. And they were from a very broad background of um, of our community, which is exactly what we're looking for. So thanks to the assessment panel, and thanks for everybody that submitted high quality um, um, grant um, applications that we could consider. Thank you, Councillor Pearl. Councillor Brand. Yes, I would like to <coughs> report from uh, the uh, board of uh, Linden New Arts. Um, uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks, Linden has successfully moved from its home in uh, Ackland Street um, temporarily into uh, uh, Domain House, which is outside the city of Port Phillip. It's in the Domain. Um, near the Botanical Gardens and has held uh, its 30th anniversary and moving into Domain House and uh, the first, the opening of Domain House, uh, uh, a couple of very well attended events uh, which have met with quite a lot of acclaim and they were very successful. Um, uh, Lyndon is going to be there for um, at least the rest of this year. Um, but is going to be uh, needing to negotiate uh, a new home, a uh, temporary home. Uh, hopefully it can stay there, but we'd, we're not clear at all, um, as the renovations of, um, of uh, Linden in Ackland Street sort of press on. Uh, anyway, that seems to be very successful and uh, done with... Um, it's, it's an amazing bunch of people who are, who are, who are working there, very impressive. Also, I want to report from the uh, the City of Port Phillip Art Acquisition Committee, uh, which had their annual uh, uh, meeting of um, uh, to get together to select um, a, a, a <laughs> acquire a lot of art to put before us. Hopefully, that's what you were doing. Yes. Um, and uh, a very, very impressive uh, board of uh, panel of uh, four expert art experts from quite um, different areas of art, but all uh, with a very, very strong Port Phillip uh, connection, um, making um, uh, very considered choices. Uh, some of which I didn't uh, didn't uh, didn't um, accord with the choices I would have made, which probably means it's uh, it's working very well and not being. Um, politically intimidated, and um, and also really serviced by a very very fine performance. I think by the the um, city of Port Phillip staff, um, the officers in charge of that have done an amazing job of putting forward the the um, uh, a possible range of uh, art to be selected from. And it's a very very complex and very very uh, uh, it's a very <laughs> it's it's a very complex. It's full of uh, pitfall. Fit, uh, pitfalls and potholes, and um, they handled with handle it with great deftness, I thought, and um, all building a fantastic collection, which continues to be built in the city of Port Phillip. Thank you, Councillor Brand. Would anyone else like to report? 
Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, now we'll move to item 11, which is urgent business. Councillors, are there any items of urgent business? There are none. We move to item 12, which is confidential matters, and there are no confidential items. So there being no further business, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you very, very much for everyone for attending.